We're going to recap the month of April, and boy, was it a fun and not so fun first month for the Pittsburgh Pirates. You are Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And that is your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team, your Pittsburgh Pirates every day. My name is Ethan Smith. Follow me on Twitter right down there at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates for all of your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates and currently the Los Angeles Clippers. But we do have a show for that, so go check him out. I'm sure he's probably saying a lot of the same things I'm saying, uh, that NBA officiating is the worst officiating in sports. And you will not change my mind on this right now. Sorry, Bryce Patrick of Locked On Rangers. This is the this is that time of year where me and Bryce are usually not friends. And then there's another time where we're not friends uh, in the sports world. But I have my friend, Gary Morgan, here as we do every Monday. And Gary, my uh, uncle said that you're a great guest on the show and asked if you uh, were on here every Monday. And I said yes, for the most part, unless you have something going on. But Gary's back today on Monday. I'm back today on Monday. Still settling in to the PA life and everything. That's why you guys didn't get five episodes last week. But from this point forward, you should be still getting adjusted and all that stuff. And the Pirates, Gary, are about a month through the season now. Obviously, we still got about two more days in the month of April. You know, the old knuckle thing. Like, you got to do the in-between knuckles. So I figured we'd recap the month. We usually did this uh, the last couple seasons that you were on the show where we used to just recap the month because usually the month usually ends close to a Monday. And what a month it's been already, <laughs> honestly, Gary. What a month and what a season it's been already because we've seen this team arguably at its highest and we've seen this team at its lowest already. Yeah, I mean, they're 14 and 15 and we should probably feel pretty grateful. Like, uh, honestly, they haven't hit like a 14 and 15 team. They've pitched like a, you know, 28 and two team, I think, at least as far wow. as the starting pitching goes. So they've been, you know, pretty fortunate to kind of land where they have. And I have a theory on why they started out so hot. And yeah. I, I, yeah. And I, I think it, it has a lot to do with coming out of spring and heading right into facing teams that aren't prepared to have their pitchers go deep to begin with. So you come out with that approach that they like to take, and you're talking about getting starters out of games in four or five innings. And the first two opponents they faced were ill-equipped to handle that to begin with, even if they were full strength. And I think it just like it kind of set them up for an easy start. You know, and I think we saw a little bit of that last year as well. So it's repeatable, mm -hmm. at least, as far as that goes. Problem is, it's not once the pitchers get stretched out and start feeling comfortable. Then all of a sudden comes the rude awakening that these guys aren't ready to hit. Yeah, and a lot of the conversation, obviously, should be around this offense right now. And it's kind of a conversation I don't think a lot of us really expected to have. I thought a lot of the conversation going into the beginning of the year obviously was going to be centered around starting pitching. And I remember us mentioning it, Gary, that even if one guy went down in this rotation, that things could get pretty shaky on the starting pitching end. One guy did go down in Marco Gonzalez, but it hasn't really felt all that different. Like it almost feels like Marco Gonzalez is just, it's fine. Like when he comes back, He'll just slot right back in and probably be the same Marco Gonzalez that we saw before. And the or will he have a place to pitch at all? Yeah, and that's a that's a big talking point too. And pitching was the big talk of the off season, and it was the oh the Pirates pitching staff is going to be horrible, but they're going to have a great bullpen. All the, and this is why off season talk rarely ever means anything when you're talking about actual on field performance. You can look at the stuff on paper and say, yeah, the Pirates offense should be a much better offense than it is right now. But we see something that, as you mentioned, that we saw last year and arguably the year before that, that they're just trying to do the exact same thing every single game and it's not working. 
And I think you had a uh, very funny tweet on Twitter yesterday about just try anything at this point. Like if it's wearing women's underwear or like any anything, like just try something to fix this. Because I get it. You know me. I'm big on trends and picking things up that happen over multiple weeks rather than a couple of days. This isn't a cold spell that's just lasting a couple days. Until that Thursday game against the Brewers, which they ended up losing 6-5, to five, they hadn't scored more than four runs or more since April 14th. They have not actually, folks, and if, I'm sure you've picked up on this for everybody listening, they have not won a series since that Baltimore series on home opening day. That's the last time that they won a series right now. And there's a lot of issues with the recap of April, because it almost feels like two different months. Like it feels like one part of the month, they look like world series contenders. And the next part of the month, they look like the pirates of 2022 again. I mean, what a difference two out hits and hits with runners in scoring position make. Yeah. You know, because they're still creating a lot of opportunity. They're just not coming through. And that's going to happen. From time to time, hitting is not linear. You don't have a team that just goes off all year for the most part. It, even the Yankees are struggling to a degree offensively, and nobody would have thought that. You certainly wouldn't have thought Aaron Judge would be doing what he's doing. There's another side to it, too. Most Pirates fans tend to just watch Pirates, mm. and I get that. But if you watch the league or you take a look at the, the league-wide numbers, Offense has taken a hit everywhere. It's brutal. I think I, I talked on my show a little bit this week about last year in April, Tampa Bay Rays were leading the league in home runs with 59. This year, as of Thursday, so I'm not gonna I'm not updating it here, but as of Thursday when I looked, the league lead was 33. Mm -hmm. Like for perspective. The Pirates hit 33 home runs last April. You know, they they were at like, I think, 18 or 19 right now. They're not going to get there, clearly. Offense is down everywhere. You know, so it's probably a little bit that Major League Baseball played with the baseballs again. They do mm -hmm. own Rawlings. There's a conspiracy that will come out at some point. Somebody will start to talk about it. The hitters will start to get frustrated. We'll hear them start to chip and chirp about the ball's not going as far as they should, and then we'll see something change sometime in May, and all of a sudden, people that were hitting balls to the warning track will be hitting home runs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's always an interesting component to it, and I, a lot of the conversation, I think, that revolves around this team right now really just has to do with things that I think I mentioned this last week when I talked to you, a lot of the issues that we saw in April, and we'll get into what's going right and what's going wrong uh, after the break. A lot of the issues that they have right now, thankfully, are fixable issues, in my opinion. They're not like injury-induced issues or things that they can't control. These are things that once some of these guys really start maybe getting off the snide, which Ben Charrington talked about a lot of guys on his radio show not playing up to projections and some guys playing over projections, which, folks, I'll just be honest with you, whatever that's supposed to mean, I can't tell you. I'm not here to tell you what that means. I don't know what his projections on players are, but there are obviously some guys that you can look at and say they're not playing up to the par that we would like them to play. At some point, you would expect that to change. And you would hope that that changes. And those are things that throughout an entire season, as you mentioned, not every player is going to be just blazing hot the entire year. Like even Luis Arise, who batted like, what, 380 last year, probably had a couple cold spells in there every once in a while. And that's why he didn't bat over 400. It happens to everybody. So we'll talk about what's going right and what's going wrong in the next segment of today's show of Locked on Pirates. Before we do that, though, folks, let's hear about DoorDash.
Today's episode is also brought to you by DoorDash. Order on DoorDash today and use code LOCKEDONMLB when you're ordering on DoorDash because does mom have a sweet tooth? Is she a tech enthusiast, a beauty connoisseur, or is she outdoorsy? Well, no matter what she's into, you can make her smile with a fruit or flower bouquet, makeup, tech gear, workout, wear, and more. Because you can get a gift card at DoorDash or get other thoughtful gifts she deserves with the convenience you need. You choose same-day delivery or schedule a week ahead for when flowers and gifts should arrive to her door with DoorDash. Shop with savings that make her proud. With a Dash Pass membership, you'll save with a $0 delivery fee and reduced service fees on eligible orders from Dash Pass merchants that meet the minimum subtotal other fees, including service fees, may apply and terms apply. So get all your Mother's Day gifts all in one place and get 50% off your next order up to $15 when you spend $15 or more on your next flower, convenience, grocery, or retail order now with Locked On MLB's code. That's code Locked On MLB and order using DoorDash today. And folks, that was DoorDash. Thank you guys for always being a wonderful sponsor of this show. We're also supposed to hear from Monopoly Go. Today's episode of Locked on Pirates is also brought to you by Monopoly Go. Download Monopoly Go free on the App Store and Google Play because folks, you know I love leaderboards. You can't ever go wrong with a leaderboard and i'm talking about the hit mobile game monopoly go when i'm talking about leaderboards you've probably heard of it it's been downloaded over 150 million times and it's a great mobile twist on classic monopoly you can play anywhere anytime you explore hundreds of monopoly boards from las vegas to camelot to the moon all while racking up a huge fortune charge rent on iconic properties just like classic monopoly and you can charge your friends rent on your iconic properties or go after their monopoly money by pulling bank heists and taking wrecking balls to their landmarks but my favorite part is the leaderboards where you can see who's a monopoly tycoon and who's gone bankrupt so get yourself on the charts and download monopoly go now free on the app store and google play how about the sponsors of the Locked on Pirates podcast always giving us some fun stuff to do? You know, Monopoly Go is pretty fun. You could sit there and play Monopoly Go while you listen to Locked on Sports Today, the 24-7 streaming channel of Locked on on YouTube and Amazon Fire TV. Make sure you go check that out. It's very fun. Obviously, all the NFL draft reactions, probably all over the place on that. There's a lot of other sports going on, obviously, the NBA and NHL playoffs. So if you need updates on that, go to Locked on Sports Today. So April's about to come to a close. They're going to Oakland for the last time, which is kind of uh, surreal because the Athletics were actually one of my uh, favorite teams growing up. I love the Athletics for some reason. So to see the Pirates go to Oakland for one last time, a little weird, a little weird. Next time they go to play the Athletics on the road, it'll be in Sacramento. Uh, That'll be interesting. But I figured... I usually like to stay positive on this show for the most part. So what's been going right, Gary, in terms of what the Pirates have done in the month of April leading into May? I mean, starting pitching. I think they've they've really given Jaron Jones a shot. And I didn't I I, I think if, if he was gonna perform like this, if they thought he was gonna perform like this, I'm not hundred percent sure they bring him north. No. To be honest with you. I think you might have seen them try to manipulate him a little bit. Uh, I think they probably expected, you know, they would take advantage of a hot arm, have him maybe get them a win or two early on, and then start to show his rookie Kellers. And they're just not seeing rookie Kellers. I mean, even yesterday's ball game where he struggled a little bit in the third, gave up back-to-back home runs, and got hit pretty hard. I don't know. He kind of circled the wagons himself and reined it back in and came back out and threw two more strong innings. You can't ask for more from a rookie and you certainly can't expect it. So if you don't think that Jared Jones and the rest of this starting rotation has been something that's gone well, I'm sorry. You just, (laughs) you ain't watching. 
I mean, like they may not be getting wins and losses in their columns because the the games are getting turned over to the bullpen, but they're 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 lights out. Yeah, and I have, I mean, you have to agree. Watching the starting rotation right now, the only thing I think that you wish is a lot of these would turn into wins because I mean it has to creep in the back of everybody's mind that how long do we get? this sustained success from this starting pitching staff? How long do we see consistent quality starts pretty much every single day from Keller, Perez, Jones, and even Bailey Falter, who's looked really good right now? I don't think a lot of people expected that one either. And it's one of those things that you would like to turn those into wins a lot more often than what they've turned into right now. Yeah. But even offensively, I know it's hard to find a lot of right right now in this offense, but there are some guys that are still performing pretty well. I mean, we've seen O'Neill Cruz kind of slowly pick it up a little bit. He's still having his struggles, but he's slowly and surely kind of starting to hit the baseball a little bit more. Hayes and Reynolds, of course, had the back-to-back homers and extra innings the other day. Uh, love that call, by the way, off the top of the ambulance. Literally, uh, He probably couldn't do that again if he tried. Um So you have the guys that are doing their stuff in the offense. And then when we shift to what's going wrong, we start with the offense (laughs) right now. And you probably heard me mention, or did I mention? No, I didn't mention them yet. I understand, folks, that Connor Joe is not an everyday player to some people. But when you have a guy in Rowdy Telez right now who, albeit I'll give him his flowers defensively, he's looked a lot better defensively than I think a lot of people expected him to. He's just not doing what he was brought here to do, though. He he is not hitting the baseball really at all. Got a hit yesterday. Connor Joe, I believe, and I, I'd have to fact check myself on this, is still the team leader in OPS. That kind of guy needs to be in the lineup every day. I wrote a story about this on Steel City Pirates last week that the guys that are performing right now and seeing the ball well need to be in the lineup every day. Find a way to do it. They have to put those guys in the lineup every single day just to try to get off the snide. And again, another problem that we've seen in past years is that Derek Shelton switches the lineup so much. Maybe just try to leave it alone. Find one that works and just leave it be for a week. I, I mean, I don't think that they're capable of of putting together something that, that works, you know, as often as we need it to. Mm-hmm. You know, like Connor Joe, for instance, you're saying play him more as a starter. He's playing five or six games a week. Like, the, the problem is, like, the, the drop-in replacement people want him to be is for Telez, but he he's also arguably been their second best outfielder. So you don't want to lose him out there either, right? I mean, like, so it it, it kind of cuts into Oliveris's time, really, because you, you want to use Connor Joe and you want him out there. And Rowdy Telez, as bad as he is, this team needs power, and he's mm-hmm. got it. And and while he's not making contact. You keep running guys like that out there in the hopes that you're going to get 20 home runs in amongst all the other crap he does wrong. You know, this team needs power. I just don't know how else to put it. Hayes isn't providing it. Reynolds provides it, but Reynolds is, he's an all around hitter. Mm -hmm. Not going to give you, you know, 50 bombs. And if you asked him to, everything else would fall apart. Yeah. Um, Henry Davis has done absolutely nothing. Well, you, nobody expected that. Henry Davis hasn't struggled to hit at any level of baseball he's ever played. This is probably the first time he's ever felt like he didn't know what he was doing at the plate entirely. Like, just think about that. Does he have the coaching to fix it? I can't tell you that. No. I, I can tell you that he's never struggled like this before. O'Neill Cruz has. O'Neill Cruz has not been a ball of fire his entire time through the system. He's struggled for periods of time. This is a guy that hasn't played in a year. And a lot of us had 40 home runs on our mind. Mm-hmm. Like, 
it's going to take a minute for him to warm to the task. This stuff, April is a time capsule for this season. And the offense isn't great, but they will get better than they are. There is talent there. I just personally don't think they have a coach to pull as much talent out as could be pulled out. That's where my problem is. That doesn't mean that I think he's actively preventing them from doing anything. Mm -hmm. He's not watching them to swing and miss on on balls constantly and have one of the worst whiff percentages in the league. You know, he's just setting them up to have two strikes where you don't succeed as often (laughs) a lot of the time because of the philosophy. There are changes that need made. They will get made. But this team will improve in this category. It will. Yeah, and I mean, for how bad they've been, I mean, it's kind of hard to figure they don't. I mean, if you want to really put this into a weird perspective, I'm pretty sure over the last week and a half, maybe even two weeks, they're probably averaging less runs than the New York Rangers averaged wins against the Washington Capitals in the NHL playoffs. Keep in mind, that's four. (laughs) It's kind of hard not to go up from there right now. And trust me, I was was thinking about that line yesterday. I'm like, I'm going to use that one on the show today. (laughs) Um, And then I know Alex Stump. uh, I always forget how to pronounce his last name. Sorry, Alex, if you're listening. Um, he provided a pretty interesting, um, statistic the other day about how much better they are when they out hit opponents. And I mean, obviously, usually that is a direct correlation to just beating teams is when you out hit your opponent more often than not, you're going to win. But I also like that you brought that up and something I want to bring up before we switch to the final segment too, is yes, I know Andy Haynes gets a lot of the crap. I wish I could say the other word on the show, but I can't. He gets a lot of the the crap put on him. There there is a large portion of it that is his fault. I mean, it's his philosophy. It's what he's teaching these guys. But as you mentioned too, he's also not teaching these guys to just miss everything, swing at stuff they're not supposed to swing at, and all these other things. So yes, some of it has to be put on the players too. And it's one of those relationships in baseball between coach and player or players for that matter, that it's just direct. There's no way to get around it. And yeah, you have the guys on the roster that are going to just overcome that philosophy. Brian Reynolds is one of those guys. He's just that good. But I think I remember you mentioning as well, how much better could Brian Reynolds be in a different philosophy? That's where I think the problem in lies is Brian Reynolds is a guy that you're paying quite a bit of money over the next half decade. Are you okay with him just being an, I don't want to say average player because he's not average at all, but slightly above average. I mean, are you paying Brian Reynolds to be slightly above average for the entirety of his time here? Cause I don't think that they want to do that. I think they want the best Brian Reynolds out there. But the question in lies, and I'm not going to answer it. I'll let everybody listening answer it. Can he be more than that in this system? I think is the biggest question. Uh, And I also think this system is overblown. This philosophy is as vanilla as it can be. Look for your pitch. Don't swing early in account on something you're not going to be able to do damage on. And Try to work the pitcher. That's it. Every team in the league wants to do that. Every team in the league tells their hitters to do that. It's about how you actually apply it. You know, you have some guys looking like they're afraid to swing at something that is borderline. Or taking a pitch is like matter of fact. I'm going to take that first pitch. And pitchers learn that crap. Mm-hmm. Pitchers know O'Neill Cruz is not swinging at that first pitch. They know it. And and when he does right now, again, this isn't Andy Haynes. He's not hitting it. No. He's swinging through fastballs right down the pipe. That is not O'Neill Cruz when he's right. And that is not coaching. That's O'Neill Cruz being rusty and slow. And <laughs> I mean, he's not even running out double plays. You know, that that he would have easily run out last year. You know, he's not getting infield hits he would have gotten last year because he's not running full tilt. 
unless he absolutely feels it's necessary or can get something out of it. There's a lot of things that are going on with this team that aren't just Andy Haynes. That's all I'm mm-hmm. saying. Fire him by all freaking means. I never wanted him hired. Yeah. You know, this isn't a defense of Andy Haynes. It's just don't be so obtuse as to sit there and think that they can replace one coach and everything's going to magically snap back. The way this team's set up, Andy Haynes isn't even hands-on coaching these guys on a daily basis. That's just yeah. not how it's set up. And it's so funny, too, and we'll stop we'll stop on this conversation before we uh, switch to the final one. You would think people that watch the Pirates, too, and also, I don't know, watch football, would kind of even make a correlation between a certain thing that happened to the Steelers last year where everybody wanted Matt Canada gone. He got gone. Did really all that much change from, from that? It's kind of the same method of thinking. Like, I would expect that it would be on a similar trajectory where if they do indeed fire Andy Haynes, yeah, they'll have the equivalent of beating the Bengals 33 to whatever the score was of that game where they put up 30 points for the first time in three years. They'll have the equivalent of that. They'll come out for a couple of games and probably drop eight runs or 10 runs, but it's not going to switch it over an entire year. Because as you've mentioned to me plenty of times off air through our conversations about the team and everything, this is a system wide philosophy. This is not just something that they just do in Pittsburgh and don't do in Altoona and Indy and Greensboro and Bradenton. This is everywhere. So trying to flip that on its head, especially in the middle of a season, virtually impossible. But I'm going to pose a question to everybody as well. The Pirates are 14 and 15 right now, I believe. Yeah, 14 and 15. Are they just around a 500 team? Is that just what they are? We'll have that conversation in the final segment before we do. Let's talk about FanDuel. Today's episode of Locked On Pirates is also brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel FanDuel.com slash Locked On has all of your betting needs in one place because baseball or playoff time in the NBA and NHL, baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 whether you win or or you lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book, and of course, a sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. So I had an interesting... Um, conversation i uh have a job up here now where i'm bartending in an american legion obviously in pennsylvania now in johnstown lots of more pirate fans to talk baseball with and one of them asked me am i okay with the team being around 500 am i okay with them being a 500 team and i answered i mean i would obviously as a fan like them to be more than that But from analyzing the team and covering the team, as I do, let's just say theoretically, Gary, that they finish 81 and 81, exactly 500. Some people would look at that and say, yeah, yeah, you know, that would be a five win improvement last year. If you look at it from that way, that's a success. That means you're moving forward. And I've also told people, that I think 2025 is the real year where you could start setting real expectations for this team. So, I mean, posing the question, and it doesn't have to have a direct answer because we still have May, June, July, August, and September. Are they just around a 500 team? Is that just the ceiling of what this team can be? I mean, I picked them to win 84 games. So, yeah, Yeah. they're around a 500 team. And 84 wins would be, what, six wins away from 90? If Mm -hmm. I told you they were going to win 90 games, you'd be like, oh, my God, you're an idiot, right? Yeah. I mean, we start to think, like, the winning team is some far-off, unreachable thing. It's not. 
81, 82 wins is not unreachable. They can get to 500. They can be above 500. And if they are, they will be in contention. That's Major League Baseball now with, with seven playoff spots. It's ridiculous. So like, Is it six you know, or seven? It's six. I'm sorry. You're going to get in, basically. If you're round 500 a little bit more, you're going to have a shot. Look at what Arizona just did last year. It's a reason they kept referencing that because that's where they think they're going to wind up, right around 80-something to 84. You talked about Ben Charrington talking about projections. He doesn't just have those for players. He has those for the team. And when they perform above or below what his projections are, well, you know, he, he makes comment of it because he believes in that crap. Whether you think that's right or wrong, he does. And if they start to overperform around the trade deadline, he'll fall back on those projections because he'll know that in his head, I'm buying into a team that I don't think is as good as they're playing, or I'm not, I'm not going to sell off because I'm not buying into the team being as bad as they look because my projections say they should be here. It's no different than Billy Bean walking into the locker room and going, is this how a good team plays? Are you guys a good team? You should be on paper. Why aren't you right? You know, Mm -hmm. it's the same thing. That's all it is. And you can hate it, but that's what it is. Yeah. And I think what a lot of people, including myself, when I hear these kind of things, obviously you're not going to hear him directly reference his projections. Like he, well, he'll reference them, but he's not going to sit there and say, oh yeah, my projection for the team is 83 wins. And if they don't get to that, then it's a failure. He's not just going to come out and say that. Now, again, we don't know what those projections are, but I do think, as you mentioned, he'll make decisions based off of those projections. It's going to be an interesting rest of the year. I really think it is because where this team sits in June, or like you said, the trade deadline, July come all-star break, it's going to be interesting. And also remember, folks, this division, I know the Pirates are 14 and 15. I believe the Cubs are leading right now, and they're 17 and 12. It's not like they're, like, astronomically behind anybody. It's not a division that you look around and you say, oh, yeah, that team right there is unbeatable. They don't have a Dodgers in their division. They don't have a Orioles or a Yankees in their division. There's no team like that in the NL Central. And as you mentioned, too, Being around 500 this year, even if it's a couple games under, say they're two games under 500 at the trade deadline, just my projection, they wouldn't exactly be all out of it in the NL Central at that point. The only way they're out of the NL Central, folks, is if they are well below 500 come that time. Could they be? Sure. I don't think they will be, but they could be. I just don't see it happening. And I think that's the interesting thing about asking the question, are they just around a 500 team? Sure. But that could have multiple different meanings. I mean, they could have being around 500 to me is 78 to 83, 84 wins. That's a big difference in the MLB scope of what you look at on the season. Like when October comes, if the Pirates win 83 games, I'm going to be like, yeah, this is a great year. They win 78 games. The conversation's a little different. And that's only five games. That's the equivalent of less than two full series. Yeah. Well, that, you're not going to have 14 game it. jumps at this point. You know, no. you're talking about like now we talk about 2025 being even better because you're talking about uh, if if health permits a full season of Skeens and Jones and Keller and all these other guys and Baba Chandler on the doorstep and Solomito on the doorstep. I mean, they could be crazy on, on the mound. And you hope that Davis figures it out and O'Neal Cruz looks better and everybody else kind of steps up and gels. Well, you could be looking at a team that maybe wins 90-some games, 95 games. Plus, you hope they invest a little more. They've got a little more invested. Mm-hmm. You know? That, that, there's a lot to look forward to. This year is not over. I think it's going to be good. I really do. I'm just not, I'm not in panic mode yet. No, I just think not. Andy Haynes gives them an unfair ceiling. That's all. Yeah. And it's an unfortunate, unfair ceiling, but we'll see 
what they can do in Oakland over the next three days as they wrap up this West Coast trip and then, of course, take the day off Thursday and return home to, ironically, play a West Coast team on Friday in the Colorado Rockies. Just getting their West Coast fix out of the way. But, folks, thank you so much for tuning in to the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team, your Pittsburgh Pirates every day. My name's Ethan Smith. Follow me on Twitter right down there at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked on Pirates. And Gary, what do you got on tap for the people this week from all of your different modes of uh, Pirates talk? Yeah, um, let's see. Series preview for the A's is up on Steel City Pirates. Go check that out. Five Thoughts of Five will be up later on today. And not this week, but next week, we're going to be having former first round pick Chad Hermanson on the Pirates fan forum. So that should be a lot of fun. Well, there you go. So make sure you guys check all that out. Keep coming to this show because we'll be back tomorrow. But until then, folks, see you on the flip side.